If you've been watching My Life in Gaming for a while, then it's no secret that I was a bit of a Sega kid growing up. From the depths of the dark, musty arcade to the lime green carpet of my childhood bedroom, I spent more time with Sega's games than anything else. Space Harrier, Shinobi, Fantasy Star, Golden Axe, these games and many more would make their mark on me for years to come. Sega Ages was a series of games released for the Saturn that celebrated Sega's legacy with arcade perfect ports and compilations of Genesis and Master System games. With the untimely death of the Dreamcast, Sega became a third-party developer. Together with D3 Publisher, they formed the company 3D Ages and created the Sega Ages 2500 line of games. This 33-volume series consisted of three-dimensional remakes, ports, and compilations at budget prices that were built internally by Sega themselves and other developers, to mixed results. Most of these games remain Japan-exclusive today, although a number of the early volumes were compiled onto a disc for a US release called the Sega Classics Collection. Seeing that there are 33 of these, it could take a while to look at each of them. In this episode, I'm going to be checking out the first five volumes of the Sega Ages 2500 series. Get ready. Fantasy Star Generation 1 is a remake of the trailblazing 8-bit sci-fi RPG, which is a heck of a game to start with. I briefly talked about this remake in an episode focused on the Master System original, but I ended up being kind of apathetic about it. In retrospect, I can tell that I didn't give it much of a fighting chance, knocking on just about every aspect of it. I wanted a Fantasy Star remake, but my love for the original would not allow me to look at this new version for what it really was. Being a remake, the story follows the same beats as the original. Alyssa Landale, who we know here in North America as Alice, sets out for revenge against the tyrannical King Lashik for the death of her brother, Nero. With the help of three additional party members, she adventures across the three planets of the Algol star system. Of course, the original came out in 1987, but it pushed far beyond what we'd seen in terms of Japanese developed console RPGs at the time. Even years later, it remains an impressively sprawling adventure. While the overarching story isn't greatly expanded upon with this version, there is substantially more dialogue between characters which is all new. There's some cool and oftentimes hilarious interactions that really expand these characters' relationships. Their personalities are fully formed. We've been looking at a translation created by some fans at the Fantasy Star Cave website. If you have a way of playing burned discs on your PS2, it's a great way of experiencing this Japanese exclusive game. Perhaps in an effort to set the tone for what we can expect from future entries in the Sega Ages 2500 series, Fantasy Star's graphics are fairly rudimentary compared to what was out at the time. These are budget titles, so it's important to set expectations as such. When I originally looked at the game, I was pretty hard on the overall style, saying that it looked like a Flash game. That was probably a bit rash. It's honestly not that bad at all, especially when you compare it to some of the other 3D Ages games we'll be covering. I came to really appreciate its simple charm, especially when playing it on a CRT television. Each of the three worlds are colorful and lushly drawn. And character sprites look good. The anime style cutscenes are nice, although I do favor the less angular style featured in the originals. There's just something about 80s anime, you know? The dungeons do retain their first person view. These were absolutely mind blowing on an 8 bit console, but are naturally much less so three console generations later. I'm not sure if their layout has changed, but modern conveniences such as the Atlas, which grants an auto-mapping feature, makes these mazes much less daunting. On the flip side, the way that the characters move through the world still kind of bothers me. They glide through towns in the overworld in a way that makes them seem like they're not actually part of the world that they inhabit. This is especially apparent when using a vehicle on the overworld. The largest overhaul lies in the battle screen, changing the first person viewpoint of the original to a more traditional third person view featured in Fantasy Star 2 and 4 allows for some smart optimizations and elaborations to the original without going too nuts. The animation and spells are rather minimal, but I do enjoy how they look. 
A new battle option called Collaboration might fool you into thinking that the devs have integrated some sort of Fantasy Star 4 style magic combo system, but this isn't the case at all. It's much less cool. Each character can equip up to two gems which allow them special battle abilities, such as auto healing or low level magic. This is especially nice for Tyrone because he has no magical ability at all. Of course, the uses here are limited because the gems are expensive and prone to breaking. I think you could probably avoid using this stuff if you wanted to. Fantasy Star soundtrack has been ingrained in my brain since I was 11 years old. So naturally, I was excited to hear how the remix soundtrack would sound. If the Fantasy Star sound collection was anything to go by, then we're in for a treat. But it's with heavy heart that the redone music is one aspect that I was consistently disappointed by. Fantasy Star Generation 1 was packaged with a mini ring binder that was meant to house these data cards that were included with future releases. Because of this, it was packaged in a bigger box. This was a fun way to track what releases you purchased, but eventually they stopped doing them. Putting some significant time into this remake, and I can safely say that I was very unfair to it the last time I looked at it. It's actually rather good. I just needed to look at it for what it really was. Maybe it's not the remake that Fantasy Star deserved, nor I wanted, but it's the one it got, for now. After such a strong start, Sega slams on the brakes and kicks it in the reverse with Volume 2. Monaco GP is a remake of their 1979 arcade game. The arcade original put people in a sit-down cabinet and gave you a top-down view of the action. It was a pioneer, but I think I was born too late to really appreciate it. Give me Spy Hunter instead. This remake naturally converts everything to polygons and gives you two modes to choose from, classic and original. Classic mode amounts to what is essentially an endless racer, which is exactly what the arcade game was. Your main objective is to survive as long as you can before you inevitably hit an oncoming car. Wreck too many times and you'll run out of time and game over. This is honestly a lot harder than it looks because it's so easy to burst into flames. Seriously, if you even so much look at an enemy car wrong, you blow up. Original mode offers a more robust experience by spinning things into more of a kart racer type of game. To add a little bit more graphical flair, the entire racetrack rotates when you make a turn. When you get a turn icon, just hit the appropriate shoulder button and boom. The objective remains the same, but now you inexplicably have the ability to make your car jump. There's also some power-up boxes that gives you one of a number of different attacks such as speed boosts and making your car larger than the competition so you can run them off the road. In addition, if you grab enough of these stars, you'll have a short period of invincibility. Feels good to turn the tables. Monaco GP was developed by Tamsoft, who had gone to do stuff like the Onichan Bara series. They honestly didn't have a whole lot to work with here based on the arcade original, and you can't really blame them for trying some new stuff. But, you know, I'm not so sure a kart racer was what I would have gone with. Fantasy Zone slips in at Volume 3. Now this, this is a real Sega classic. Who doesn't love little Opa Opa? If you ask me, he was the true Sega mascot before Sonic the Hedgehog, not Alex Kidd. <laughs> Fantasy Zone was released in the arcades in 1986, but I mainly knew of it as a Master System game. It's a side-scrolling shooter, but instead of moving just forward, you can fly left or right. If you continue in one direction, the level repeats. It's more like Defender on Crazy Pills than your typical shooter. Your main objective is to destroy enemy bases strewn across the land. Shooting down enemies makes them drop money, which then you can spend in shops that randomly appear. 
Here, you can buy high-powered weapons, bombs, and speed boosts. The weapons only last a set amount of time or until you die, so make sure you know the best way to use them. Once you destroy all the enemy bases, then it's time to take on the boss. Developer Sims was smart to keep things as close to the original as possible. It features the arcade music, while the world was simply converted to polygons. Opa Opa and enemies have been redone in a cel-shaded style that truly fits this world while enabling some additional freedoms when it comes to viewpoints. As such, there are 3D bonus stages where you collect the money that a boss drops when you beat them. These were pretty well done, and I feel like they could have been a bigger part of the game. As it is, these are a nice ode to the unreleased Space Fantasy Zone on the PC Engine. There's a nice chunk of bonus features, and hey, they're actually useful. By collecting money in a challenge mode, you can then purchase additional features such as continues, a sound test, and most importantly, rapid fire. Trust me on this. Go for the rapid fire first. It'll save your hand and make everything else way more enjoyable. Fantasy Zone is an absolutely worthy remake, and perhaps that's because it stays so close to the original. The bright colors and bizarre backgrounds make for a wholly unusual experience that is a really fun look into where Sega was at in the mid-80s. Sega keeps things in the fantasy zone with Volume 4, Space Harrier. This 3D re-envisioning of the 1985 arcade Super Scalar game by Yu Suzuki was done by Tamsoft. Don't worry, don't worry, it's better than Monaco GP. Space Harrier is a third-person rail shooter where you run and fly across an extraordinary world filled with weird obstacles and even more eccentric enemies. It's pretty straightforward, kill everything or die. The original version saw a bunch of ports and sequels over the years, but the 3D Ages version marked the first time that the original was fully remade. Stating the obvious, Space Harrier isn't exactly a looker. Using default settings, the original signature checkerboard ground is gone and replaced with a rather bland looking texture that is filled with bumps and hills which means that Harrier can't exactly run on it. Going to the options screen and toggling the fractal mode will restore the original style and pride. Space Harrier without the checkerboard is an awful idea. Welcome to the fifth season. Get ready. Putting them back makes things seem a lot more natural, and honestly just more fun to play since running on the ground is such an important part of the gameplay. Filling in some check marks in the unnecessary additions column, Harrier can now lock onto multiple enemies using a Panzer Dragoon style homing shot. Additionally, you now have a smart bomb attack that clears the screen of everything. I gotta tell you though, this thing is super overpowered. You can clear a good amount of the stage bosses just using one. One place that this remake really exceeded my expectations is with the musical theme. This is one of my favorite tracks of all time, and hearing this rendition was a pleasant surprise. The announcer's voice is suitably inspiring too, making you feel really good about restoring peace to the fantasy zone. Now, I'm going to be up front here. I really, really love Space Harrier. Heck, it was the game that made me fall in love with video games in the first place. You'd think that all signs would point to me not liking this game, but I do. A lot. It's janky in a lot of ways, but I had a lot more fun with this version than I ever expected to. Something about it just worked for me, you know? Volume 5 belongs to Sega's iconic hack and slash, Golden Axe. The arcade original is timeless, and the Genesis port is a highlight of the console's first year. Beyond those, the sequels, save for the arcade exclusive Revenge of Death Adder, really failed to grasp the first game's magic in my opinion. Maybe a remake of the original was just what was needed. <laughs> Holy mackerel! What happened here? 
to say that this 3D remake of the original is bad is putting it lightly. I honestly have no idea how Sims, who had just done a great job on Fantasy Zone, managed to mess this up as badly as they did. The game begins with a story segment showing the history of the Golden Axe and how it came into the possession of the evil Death Adder. Three characters set out to reclaim the axe and bring peace to the world by slicing and dicing palette swap versions of about four or five different enemies. You can set out alone or team up with a friend for some co-op action, which is where the real fun is. Unfortunately, the action in this version itself is never really engaging or any fun at all. You're probably going to get pretty bored here. Enemy groups pop out in a steady stream over the course of some insanely drawn out and padded levels. Weird choices like splitting the first level into two nearly 10 minute levels keep Golden Axe far away from the breezy romp of the original. It would probably help if every character didn't look and move so awkwardly. Sometimes you get caught performing a combo and your character will attempt to throw at the enemy, but instead just end up with handfuls of nothing. Look at the way that the beasts that you can mount just glide across the ground. Even your magic spells are a disappointment. The dragon's fire in the original was awe-inspiring. Here, there's like nothing to get excited about. In short, pretty much all the ambiance and style that was integral to the original game's identity and appeal has been stripped away or modified to the point where it's no longer recognizable. For instance, all of the bonus stages between each level have been removed. You know, the ones where some magic elves steal your food or magic potions and you have to beat them up to get it back. Here is just a cutscene after the first level that really goes nowhere. There's absolutely no resolution or payoff to the situation. Heck, even the character select screen says all that needs to be said about this remake. Where there was once a giant skeleton holding all three characters in the palm of its hand, there's now a simple menu showing each character. The lone bright spot here is the music. It really makes you think for a second that you're playing a much better game than you are. I like to think that I'm generally pretty easygoing when it comes to games. I like what I like and rarely do I simply despise a game. This unfortunately is one of those times. Golden Axe is an awful attempt at recreating anything close to the appeal of the original. These games were supposed to be a celebration of Sega's heritage, but when a remake misses the mark so intensely as Golden Axe does, it really makes me nervous about what the future releases have in store. Next up, I'll be covering volumes 6 through 11. There's some possibilities for greatness in there. Virtue Racing, Game Ground, and Afterburner come to mind. But a few more Golden Axes, and we might have a problem. <laughs>